Well, we have a lot of visitors here at Redgate Farm, and when people drive down the driveway, inevitably they get to the house and they ask, what in the world is that? So I answer, it's a wallapini. That doesn't help much. So why don't we have a greenhouse that loses heat out of more sides than it actually gains heat? It's not a very good idea. It's not very efficient. So a wallapini essentially opens up the side that gains the sunlight, but closes off and heavily insulates or burns up with earth the side that does not have any sunlight. Follow us now as we go through the design of the wallapini. So the overall idea is Wherever I'm gathering solar energy, I want that to be a large surface. Where I'm not gathering solar energy, I want it to either be a small surface so I don't lose heat, or I want it to be underground or heavily insulated. So let's take a look at this. We're in the northern hemisphere. So this is the south-facing roof right here. I'm gaining a tremendous amount of solar energy through there in the winter and some in the center to get here to my grow bed. However, my north side is buried underground. So is the bottom, and so is the front wall, because I don't want to lose heat here. So, this, these angles all depend on what latitude you are, and of course, whether you're in the north or the south. In the northern hemisphere, the sun is to the south of us, so being south-facing. In the winter time, I, the sun is about 26.6 degrees in the winter solstice, which is around December 21st. At that point, I, get, I can get max penetration through the wall if I set this perpendicular to that. But what I do is I set that perpendicular on January 15th because that's my coldest month. So if I look at my latitude and I look at the azimuth of the sun on January 15th, I'm going to put this front wall or front roof perpendicular or 90 degrees to the sun angle. And for me, that's 30 degrees. So the sun is 30 degrees off of the horizon, so my front wall is 60 degrees. In the summertime, the sun goes up, and where I am, that's at 76.6 degrees. Now notice here, when the sun comes through in the wintertime, it goes back and it hits these barrels, and it heats them up. That heat is gathered and then dissipated at night when the sun is down. However, in the summertime, as the sun comes up, I don't want it to hit the barrels. So you'll notice here, it's hard to see, 
but that steel roof up here stops right here, and there's a small bit of glazing up here. That bit of glazing is just enough to allow that summer sun to get down and hit my grow bed, but not enough for it to hit the barrels because I don't want the sun to hit the barrels in the summertime. I want them to be nice and cool. So as you can see, these angles are all dependent on where you are, where you live. And you can gather that data off the internet. It's pretty easy to get. Now let's look at this back roof here. This is all water collection. All the rain that comes down goes into the gutter, through a pipe, and fills up the 55-gallon barrels. There are 30 of them in the back. That's about 1,650 gallons of water that I can contain in the back. That's a lot of thermal mass. It's also a lot of water for the grow bed. And we'll show you that in a second, too. The front wall here. Why do I have such a deep pit? Well, realize that even though this is collecting my solar energy, it is also allowing cold to basically come through the front wall into the wallopini in the wintertime. I want that cold air to run down the front wall, fall deep into the earth, because this earth doesn't change temperature. It stays about 55 degrees. That's called a cold sink. The cold air falls to the bottom and is heated by the earth and then slowly comes back up here and meets with the warm air and the radiation from the barrels in order to give me a nice stable temperature in the winter time. One note here, you won't be able to see this outside, but there is a drain tile that comes through here and empties out in the back in the north slope. That's very important because as water comes down in here, it can actually on heavy rains fill up down there and it drains nicely, but this also allows air to flow in in the winter time. And as that cold air from outside comes from way down in the woods, goes through about 65 feet of earth before it comes into the bottom, that earth heats up that air so that I can get good airflow back into the Wallapini, but it's not bitter cold air. All right, let's back up and take a look at the actual Wallapini. All right, let's go from pictures to practicality. When we built the Wallapini, the first thing we had to do was dig a 60-foot trench. And luckily, at the same time, we were building a pond in the pasture, and my excavator had his big backhoe out here. So I said, can you dig me a big trench along the driveway? And he thought I was a little nuts, but within a couple hours, he did it. The front was eight feet below grade. Then there was a shelf that was four feet below. And I had him pile all the dirt in the back side. Once I had that hole, I got on the lumber mill, and I milled a whole bunch of big pillars. I have pillars, 16 pillars on the front wall, 16 pillars on the back wall. I had a little help from one of our woofers, Worldwide Opportunity for Organic Farmers, who was here from France and she was an engineer. So she helped me design the roof structure that would exactly meet up with the sun angles that we talked about earlier. So once we designed that, I built a template in the barn and I built 16 of those trusses to go along the top. Once those were in place, we got the twin-walled polycarbonate. We put that in place, got the tin on the top, the gutters, put all the barrels inside, and it all came together. I won't say there weren't some issues, but uh, it eventually came together. There's all sorts of designs out there. We kind of tried to stick with one because we just couldn't make decisions on what we exactly wanted. One thing we thought about was the grow bed itself. You can, you can make a big grow bed and you can uh, make walkways and stuff to get back to other things. But we thought, you know what, if we do 36 to 48 inches of grow space, then we can stand there in the cold sink and we can do everything without ladders, without climbing up, without walkways. We could do everything from a nice, comfortable area right down there in the walkway. So that's why we decided this. Now that's where the front wall and the back wall, this is all about angles. I want the sun to come in and hit this grow bed and make it all the way back there. In the winter, I want it to capture not only the grow bed, but the entire tank. In the summer, I want it to come down and hit the grow bed, but not the tank. So all these dimensions for the front wall, the grow bed, how high it is, 
and how wide it is. It's all based on sun angles and how you can get solar radiation on, on this bed here. So we go back to the tanks here. These are the 55-gallon drum tanks that we have, and uh, we were lucky. There was a company in town that we got these for $5 a piece. We connected them on the bottom with PVC piping, and then three areas in the Wallapini, we have a pipe that comes out here with a valve, and this is an inline filter because we have drip lines here that feed water to the grow bed. And that's very nice because that inline filter gets out all any grit or something that comes out of the gutter and cleans it before it gets to the drip line. Any of you that use drip lines know you have to have a filter, otherwise they clog all the time. So I can control, there are three sections of this bed. I can do section one, section two, section three, do all three of them, do two of them, whatever. I can control it with valves here on the inlet pipes or on the actual soaker hoses themselves but they all go through a filter. That's kind of key because a lot of times we will plant in sections. If you notice before I was standing down in section one, it was planted about a month ago. Section two here was just planted. So we watered that bed separately. Now these tanks should be all level so that as the water comes into the tanks on the end, it will go through this pipe and level throughout. It's very important to keep these clean and not always easy to do so. So let's hop down from here and take a look at some other aspects. So let's talk about the floor a little bit. We need airflow. We need air coming in and transferring out of the Wallapini because you need to have carbon dioxide. You can't just close it in and make it airtight. That'll stabilize the temperature, but it will not stabilize your carbon dioxide levels. So how does air get into the Wallapini? Well, there's a couple ways. First of all, that drain tile that is underneath the floor. We're going to pick this up in a second and show you that. Secondly, behind me, there is a large 18-inch culvert that goes out, up those steps, and back into the woods. It brings a large amount of airflow, again, through the earth underground so that the earth can actually heat it up before it comes in. The floor is slatted so that air can come off that front wall, fall down, hit the earth, and then come back up. Now these slats are kind of rough looking because when I milled the walnut trees out in the pasture when my friend was building the pond, I took the branches, which normally are not good for lumber, and I said, you know what? I can make a bunch of short little slats and build a floor out of those branches. Normally you wouldn't mill that type of lumber. You'd use it for firewood. But I knew these were all going to be short, and I knew I just needed durability and resistance to rot. And that's what you get with walnut. Now, some people are a little angry that I built the floor out of walnut, but uh, hey, that's what's available. So let's pick this up and show you. I've got each of these sections such that I can pick them up and get under the floor. And although it's not terribly easy, we can now see this drain tile here. I allow water to come in. The front wall, I don't want to block it off because hyd hydro, uh, hydrostatic pressure is extremely powerful and it can cause it to cave in. So I allow it to flow in, build up down here. This brings air in and it brings water out of the Wallapini. What we intend to do in the future is to actually fill this with sawdust and put some spores down there and allow mushrooms to grow. And I'm really excited about that new project, and I'm gathering a lot of sawdust from the lumber bill to get that started. So let's take a look at the top side now. So the roof is important because, especially in the winter, you can lose a lot of heat out of this roof. And I've got these insulating panels back here, but you can see that they're divided. There's an insulating panel back here that's permanently affixed, and then there's an insulating panel up here that actually comes out. You turn these little wooden pegs, you drop these out, and I drop those out in the summer because that's where my sun comes in in the summer. I have a 76.6 .6 degree azimuth in the sky, and that sun actually comes through the top and comes right down there on the grow bed. But in the winter, the sun is way too low. In fact, from fall around October time all the way to March, the sun is too low to ever come in through the top, so there's no reason to have that exposed. I put these insulating panels in and block it off. It's also important here, what also is blocked off are the vents up front. So when we go outside, we're going to show you the backside and we're going to show you the vents out front 
that allow that hot air in the summer to escape. So we're on the front side or the south side, and this is where all my solar radiation comes in. But I had to vent the top. So what I did is I designed these vents on the front side that are on hinges. And during the summer, I can pen these up and allow the highest part of the roof to vent the hot air out. And I can screen those to keep things out if I need to. But you can see the front side of the thermal insulating panels there sticking out closes right over the top of it and keeps all that heat in during the winter time. Well, this front wall is eight millimeter twin walled polycarbonate. We went with twin wall, it's a little more expensive, but it's actually got an R value. It's only R2, but you'd be surprised how much cold can get through this if you just use plastic. Now, if you do use plastic, that's fine. You need to pull it tight and it's probably best to have two layers. So depending on how much you want to spend, you also look at things like transmissivity, how much solar energy is actually getting through that surface. And also you look at strength too, because you're going to get a snow load. Now with a 60 degree front wall, not a lot of snow load there, but if you're looking at the top side, that's only 30 degrees. And so you're going to get some snow load up there. Uh, but we've been really happy with this. It's very durable. We've got some really high winds here, and it, it just it doesn't flex or beat or anything, and uh, we haven't lost a panel, and I think we've been out here for five years. So I'm really happy with this. One thing that uh, we kind of had to do a, a repair on here was this, this soil in the front wall sunk down a little bit, but I realized in hindsight it would be better to actually pour a wall there. It's not too much more costly but it's significantly stronger and it would keep that front wall protected. When it sank down, it exposed some of the tin on the wall and of course, cold will go right through that tin. So we've had to stuff straw on this front side to give some insulation on the front side. So we're on the north side now. So the north wall is completely covered with the berm that's in the back. The north facing roof is covered with tin because I'm not going to get sun through that. But at the very top, in the summertime, the sun is high enough that I do get some sun through there. I've got some polycarbonate up there. But you'll also make note of the fact that sunlight travels most efficiently through a surface at 90 degrees. So that front wall at 60 degrees takes max penetration on January 15th. Well, in the summer, when that sun comes through the top, it does not hit at 90 degrees. It hits at somewhat of an angle and deflects some of it, keeping some of the heat out of there. I get plenty of solar energy to the plants in the summer, but I don't want that intense heat. So even though that lets some in, it also reflects quite a bit off. So these angles, again, are critical, and you really want to think about that when you do your wall of painting. So for those of you who watched our video capturing the rain, you've seen this before, but let's go over it again. On the north wall, you've got the water running down and into the gutters, but I have a leaf guard here to try to get all sticks and leaves and anything we can out. Once it comes into the six inch gutter, it goes down to the inlet pipe that also has a screen on it before it enters inside the wall of Pini. Once inside the wall of Pini, it falls into the tank, which has a screen on the top, and then equalizes through the PVC on the bottom of the tank. Then the lines that go out to the drip line, as I showed before, they have inline filters. A lot of filtration to get that sediment out before it actually gets to the drip lines. In addition to the soaker hose, we have two spigots in the wall of Pini that are directly from the tanks underground and out the front wall. We use those specifically for filling watering cans to water individual plants. So one entrance is actually a ramp and the other one is stairs. We specifically wanted a ramp because we do bring wheelbarrows down here and sometimes small equipment down here. So ramp on one end, stairs on the other end. So pest control in the Wallapini is just like any other greenhouse. Aphids are always a nightmare for us. Uh, cabbage looper get in here too, but we sometimes use sacrifice plants. 
plants that attract aphids and, and those uh, cabbage loopers and we'll give up those plants, but it'll also tell us that they're there so we can take action against them. A couple things we do is here we've got, uh, I think we've got some aphids here on the bottom of this guy and uh, you can see that it's eaten up there. But over here we've got a little, if Danielle can pan over, we put little cups in the soil and we put beer in them. And as you can see, the worms love the beer. Worms, pill bugs, cabbage loopers, they like the beer and they go in the beer, they get drunk and they drown. So that's some way to control pests in the wallopini. We also release ladybugs every once in a while. And the thumper here, or this is a buzzer actually, this is for voles. It's solar powered and it buzzes every once in a while to send sound through the ground that they don't like. So it keeps the voles out of here because you can have quite a few of them dig under the wall over there and get in. We could have put down screening below the grow bed, but we decided not to do that and this seems to be pretty effective. Now the way we designed this, we were hoping that it wouldn't freeze in the winter. And it took about three years before we got a freeze-free wallaprini. We had to do a couple of modifications and seal up a few areas up in the front wall. And we kind of have to do that every year because things shift around. But because it's freeze-free, it's especially useful in the February-March time frame where we can start all our seedlings in here. And it, they harden better when they transition from here to the outside as opposed to going from grow lights in the basement outside. And the way we do that is we have boards up here that we lay along the rafters and we put all our seed trays up here and do all our starts right up here while we still have growth on the grow bed. Now, some of the growth on the grow bed is taken out in the spring to make room for seedlings, but when you come in here in the springtime, it's pretty much this top layer and all of the grow bed that doesn't have plants on it have seedlings getting ready to head back outside for spring. So some of the benefits of the wall of peony really didn't come to fruition until we did a little research. We planted tomatoes in here and harvested tomatoes on Christmas Day a couple years ago. Uh, we had some hot season plants to see how long they would go. We had some cold season plants which really thrive throughout the winter. We've actually put some tropical plants in here. At one time we had banana plants, one on each end, and these were dwarf bananas. And I don't know what happened, but apparently they like the wallapini because these banana plants grew so tall and vigorously, they pushed my ceiling panels out. So, um, so we got rid of the banana plants. But uh, a friend of ours gave us this aloe plant, and I think he was kind of daring us to put it in here because he said, yeah, does it really not freeze in the winter? Well, that was three years ago, and as you can see, this aloe plant is thriving, and it's got a bunch of pups behind it. So... Yes, it is frost-free year-round, and this aloe plant absolutely loves it. The only problem I have with this is that I have to keep these drip lines away from it because aloe does not like a lot of water. It likes desert, so i got to be careful when I hand water around it, too. Uh, this is a pomegranate. We've already picked our pomegranate for this season. We've got a little orange tree, lemon tree, uh, lime tree, and we're planning on it using a spellier system here to try to bring these plants out along this rafter here and out along this one so that it doesn't block too much on the grow bed so I'll let them grow up there and not block the grow bed too much. We'll see how that works but these are all tropical plants and uh, obviously all of them would die in the winter if it froze in here so that's maybe just a little bit of arrogance for us to put tropical plants into a wallapini. So over the years, we've tried really hard through experimentation to figure out exactly how to get the best use out of the wallapini. And what we realized was there are some times of the years there's nothing in here. And that's mostly midsummer. I've got plenty of food coming out from there. I don't need to be spending time in here. And I'm not going to get a whole lot out of here anyway. But the critical time is really fall. You're pulling a lot of stuff out of the garden. You're trying to dehydrate. You're trying to can. You're trying to freeze. You're trying to process. And you really don't want to be harvesting out here because you have plenty of food out there. But if you plant in here, like that first bed was planted in August, but that food's all going to be spent probably in December time frame. So you push that back a little, and September, October seems to be the ideal time. Now, some of this was planted in October, and it may be a little bit late. But realize January, March time frame, our starts are coming back in here, so we want the beds to be kind of clearing out at that time too. So it's all a timing thing. It's not only 
when you plant, but it's what you plant. And that's something that we've learned over the years too. And Danielle's done a good job of figuring that out. So we look down here and we've got some cabbage that's going to pop up here in a couple months. That'll be really good. Arugula, that's going to come up in just a couple of weeks. So we can start throwing that into some salads. Radishes, I like radishes, beets, turnips, uh, those root crops. I like to ferment those. So I can plant those any time of the year and then get them in jars with the brine and ferment them. And uh, it, you know, a lot of the fermenting takes the, the sting out of a radish, but that crisp crunch and that pickle flavor, ah, oh, it's unbeatable. I love it. Carrots are great because carrots can grow uh, at all times of the year, but they don't really like hot weather. They really like cold weather. So when you plant them in the wall of peony and they grow through that cold season, uh, February time frame, you're picking carrots, and they are as sweet as a sucker. I just absolutely love the carrots that are grown on the wallapini. So now, uh, even our sacrifice plant, you know, we put these sacrifice plants, like I said, you know, we, we get some aphids on here. We say, hey, we got an aphid infestation. But isn't it interesting that even our sacrifice plant produces a beautiful turnip and turnip greens? So... Oh, that is beautiful, isn't it? And finally, we're ending up down here. We've got some lettuces, more ca uh, carrots. We've got some chard behind it, but I'm going to sneak in here, see if we got some bush beans to pick here. Oh, yeah, we got a couple of them. I love these bush beans. They also get really sweet when, when growing in the cold here. But uh, like we say on Redgate Farm, we do things a different way. Bon appetit. Some people ask how I got this crazy idea to do a wall of peony or how I even heard about it. Well, back when I was a professor at the Air Force Academy, one of my engineering students actually brought it to me as an idea, and I was intrigued. I began to research and realized there's very little resources online or in books about how to build it or, or what angles to use or anything. So a lot of it was just, hey, let's dig a hole and see if we can figure it out. Well, over the last five years, we've learned a lot. We didn't do it exactly the way it should have been done, maybe, but I would do a lot of changes, but I would definitely, I, in the future, I'm going to build another one, and I'm going to incorporate some of the things that I've learned, and I would like to help other people build them, too. This is a very exciting adventure for us, and, and we're really excited about this. Well, that include, concludes our farm tour series here at Redgate Farm. I hope you've enjoyed the videos. And coming up next... We are now, Danielle is going back to her roots and working with wild mustangs again like she did years ago through the TIP program. So stay tuned. I think you'll enjoy that.